Tuesday everyone. I hope you guys are all doing fantastic. Welcome to my little corner of the world. This is the Ninja Chickens channel and my name is Maria. You can find me on Instagram as ninja.chickens. You can find me on Ravelry as Ninja Chickens. You can find me on Patreon as Ninja Chickens. <laughs> Most people probably don't know my name is Maria Muscarella <laughs> because they just know me as Ninja Chickens. Um, I want to send a special thank you out to the Patreons who are supporting this podcast. I really appreciate it. I um, changed up the tiers a bit last time and um, mentioned that on the podcast, but it's all available on Patreon. There's only two tiers, and you guys help support my making and my, my creating, as well as keeping this podcast ad-free. So I really appreciate it. I hope everybody's doing great. It's been a good three, almost four weeks, I think, since I've seen you guys. I think it was right before the new year. And it's been a busy few weeks. So I want to talk to you guys today about what I have been up to, what I'm going to be up to. Um, I want to talk to you about some finished objects because I have a few of them. Uh, a little bit about some dyeing with lichen. Um, and show you Leaf's finished vest because he decided he wanted to dye it. So, I want to start out with what I've been up to. <clears throat> so the biggest thing in the last few weeks is that I taught at Vogue Knitting Live up in New York. It was their 10th anniversary this year and my first time teaching at the New York Vogue Knitting Live. And it was crazy and amazing and really, really fun and really, really intense. <laughs> you know, if you know me, you know that I live out on 25 acres in um, just outside of the town of Asheville. And Asheville's a nice sized little city, but um, but it's quiet and slow. <laughs> so going up to New York and being in and around all the buildings and all the concrete and all the people, there was one point actually when um, my, Mars, I was uh, rooming with my friend Mars, who was also teaching there. She's a Hey Brown Berry. Most of you know her from her podcast or from Instagram. But there was one point where we were walking on the streets and it was like the stereotypical New York movie where just the whole crowd is coming towards you. We were walking towards Penn Station at a time that a train had just arrived. Um, and I guess it was close to rush hour as far as walking ghosts because people were going to work and it was just this mass <laughs> walking towards us everybody in their dark black coats because it was cold out and I tried to get a good video of it but um, I opened my camera up too late so I only caught the end of the the mass but it was it was kind of funny we just laughed but it was amazing we stayed um, we were all the teachers were put up in the hotel which was the Marriott Mar Marquis which was super fancy I've never been in a hotel like that before the elevators were like these UFO shuttle pods going off into space. <laughs> they were all the outer ring of this um, of this elevator was glass. And I don't I climb things and I do things at heights, but I don't necessarily like heights and I really don't do well with movement when it's that kind of movement. So I would walk in and I would turn around and have the glass behind me and just basically be like two feet from the door so I didn't see anything else. At one point I tried really hard to watch the floors going by as I was in that glass elevator and I couldn't, I had to turn around. But I did get some videos of it so I'll try and put those up for you so you can see. It was, it was pretty, pretty wild. So during the weekend I taught four classes. There were over 70 teachers there and over 200 classes. It was an, ama an amazing group of people who were teaching there, and um, I did get a, didn't get a chance to really go out into the marketplace very much, um, but it looked like there was a fabulous group of vendors also. A lot of really cool stuff. I did buy one thing on the last day. I was getting ready to leave, um, and I was able to run through the marketplace, and the first place I noticed was out in kind of the hallway, and there was this lady... Um, I don't remember the name of her business, but I'll, I'll put it down below. And she was selling lotions and lip balms and deodorant, and I just ran out of deodorant, so I got some natural deodorant. It smells so yummy. <laughs> that was the only thing that I bought at Vogue Knitting. I bought deodorant. I wish I'd had more time to get in and about the marketplace, but I, I was teaching all weekend, so 
I did four classes, um, a natural dyeing 101 class, two eco printing classes, and food medicine and dye and fiber class, which I really love that one because that really combines my love for herbs and medicine along with the natural color, so that's a lot of fun. We taste and see and experiment with eight different plants, and we dye with three of them. We have those dye bats going while we're talking about the plants, so that's always a lot of fun. Um, I brought one silk from the Eco Printed Silk class because I just wanted to show you how cool it turned out. There's um, fern and grape leaves. This big one right here is passion flower, um, ginkgo, and this right here was um, eucalyptus, some orange eucalyptus. So I knew that I was going to be teaching in New York in January, and there was going to be no flora around other than what you could purchase because everything's going to be off the trees. So I dried and froze as much as I could so that I could bring it up there. And then I went to the flower market, the flower district, um, the day before classes started and was able to walk around and grab some roses and some goldenrod um, and a few other things. And I was expecting, I, I, I don't know what I was expecting, I didn't know that at a wholesale flower district you buy the whole bunch or you don't buy anything at all. So I would ask, how much is this? And they'd say, well, it's $1.25 a stem. There's five stems in a bunch and six bunches. So it's, you know, however much. And I'm like, okay, well, I'd like two stems. I'm like, no, 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 you buy the whole bunch. So um, it was a little more expensive than I was expecting it to be because I had to get a bunch of roses and a bunch of eucalyptus. Um, but we had lots of flowers to play with, and there was one student who was so conscientious about the flowers that were left over that at the end of the last class she came over and got all the carnation, head, the carnation flower heads and rose flower heads and brought those back to her apartment in New York so she could use them, which I thought was really cute. Oh, one other thing that I was excited about is a few weeks back, sometime in December, Knit Crate, who has a, new, a company called Dyer Supplier, asked if they could supply some yarn for my class, for my dyeing classes. I had already gotten and mordanted the yarn that I needed for the class. So they sent packs that we could experiment with that the students could also take home and dye at home. And my requirement for them was it had to be non-superwash with no plastic in it. And they said, well, that's cool because we just came out with a new one. And it's 100% merino, uh, four plies. So I know in the UK a four ply just basically means fingering weight, but this actually has four plies. So it's a sturdy merino yarn, and it's a fingering weight yarn um, as well, but there's no plastic, no, no superwash. I have not seen it on their website yet. So if you are looking at dyer supplier and you're wanting the non-superwash yarn, contact them and hopefully they'll get that up there soon. But um, it was a lovely yarn to dye with. Okay, so the other thing that I was able to do after, right after Vogue ended. Okay, well first I have to tell you about the talk that Marsh did Sunday morning. She did a, a lecture called The Love Language of Making, and I, this, uh, everybody needed to be there. This was the best lecture ever. It was applicable not just to our making, but also to our lives, and how we talk about ourselves. It was all about how we phrase how we use language um, in, in how we talk about our, our making. For example, someone comes up to you and says, wow, that's such a gorgeous sweater, and you immediately say, thanks, it's not really the size that I wanted, and I don't really like how the underarms came out, and you start talking about how you didn't really do as best as you, uh, uh, you didn't really create what you wanted to. When they're coming at you with this energy of love and you push back with this, you know, it's not good enough that that kind of language hurts us. And I mean, that's, you can apply that to any, anything you do in your life. You know, wow, that was a great goal. Yeah, it was, but it took too long to make that goal and whatever. You know, the, how we downplay um, ourselves and don't give ourselves self-love in that way. And there was a lot of really cool points in, you know, how we talk about our making, the, the um, and, and the words that we use that, like being on a yarn diet and how we say we're restricting ourselves instead of we're consciously consuming yarn and just those little things. It was a really good talk. So if you get a chance to see that, 
the love language of making. I'm not sure where she's doing it again next, but if you follow her, I'm sure she'll mention it. Love is patient. Love is kind. kind. And so should be our language. Patience and kindness. That is love. And who deserves that from you more than you? Love is also a verb. Love is an action word. It takes work. It often takes reframing to get back to loving something. Ever frogged a project and fall back in love with the yarn? Because you freed yourself from whatever made you frog it in the first place, and now you're back to the thing that you loved in the beginning. So then after that, we traveled to Ann Choi's farm in New Jersey, and I traveled with Sylvia, who is with cherries on top too. She is, you, you may know her from the Nubian Queen sweater that she did in Tarja on. It's absolutely amazing. And she recently came out with a cardigan that has village on it. Super beautiful. And I also, we also traveled with a woman named Soraya, who is behind Malika Wire on Instagram. Now, uh, so they had a fashion show at Vogue that was, uh, well they had many fashion shows, but one of them was for up and coming designers, um, fashion creators. And I believe it was six people were chosen out of a large number of people to be mentored and then part of this fashion show. And Soraya was one of them. And she created this outfit that was just insane. I, it, I don't even know how to describe it, and I wish I had pictures for you that really did it justice. The top part is fiber and wire with beads knitted into it, um, all done in panels as it's put together. And the bottom part was a skirt that was wire and fire, <laughs> wire and fiber. Um, so she knitted these panels of wire and fiber, placing beads at specific points, and when you put it on, it's like fire. It just lights up and glows when you spin. It's so amazing. And Anne put it on at one point during the time when we were at her farm. And she was so funny. She's just slowly spinning around. She had this look on her face of ecstasy. <laughs> so, um, so it was absolutely beautiful. And she, that got to be on the runway and part of the fashion show. And if you, I will link, um, I'll put everybody's Instagrams down below so you can see the beautiful cardigan that that um, Sylvia made and Soraya's dress and everything and see the farm where Anne lives. Um, but it was it was just a wonderful couple of days. It was a nice way to come down from the crazy high of Vogue Knitting Live to be able to chill with some really beautiful people and have great conversations. So that was my trip to New York. I've been home for about a week and a half now and it's been really nice to just be here and be quiet and I've been working on plans for the coming year. I have put, as far as I know, all of the classes on the web on my website for things that I'll be teaching. I know that I'm going to be doing a class in Charlotte at the UNC Botanical Gardens in May. I'm also going to be doing a full eco printing weekend at the Yadkin Valley Fiber Center in North Carolina. Um, at the beginning of May, in July, I'm going to be near Roanoke, Virginia, doing an eco-printing day, and I'm going to be up in um, Massachusetts with Prado Delana doing some eco-printing and indigo dyeing up there in September. On the homestead, the plans right now are uh, sometime in April, I believe it's April 18th, Mars of Hay Brown Berry, and I are going to be putting on an indigo day. The details are coming. I don't have it all on the website. I just have the date listed. But if you're interested, let me know. And we're working on the class description and all the details. It's going to be a really fun day. We're going to make a henna indigo vat and then do lots of shibori dyeing. And then in August, I'll be doing another indigo day up here, but that's going to be focused on fresh indigo. I'm hoping to have not just the Japanese indigo, but also the um, indigo tutorium growing up here so that we can play with both of them, do salt indigo dyeing and ice indigo dyeing and also have a vat so it'll be a full day of indigo play. And then in September I'm going to be doing eco printing for the winter, preparing for your winter. So we'll do a silk, that could be a gift. We will also eco print on a wool scarf, which can be for yourself to warm you up for winter. And we will be doing a cotton pillowcase so that you have something to relax your head on during the winter. 
So those are up and coming classes. All the details will be coming to the website, but the dates are listed on the website so far. And that's ninjachickens.org. The other thing that is up and coming that I'm super excited about is I'm going to be going to Norway in a few weeks. Um, Patricia of Knitography, or P4Chen, on Instagram is working with her local fiber art group to create a really amazing and beautiful retreat up there in Norway in the fall. And as part of a test run, I'm going over there with a few other knitters in February and we are going to get to sit and knit and have tea and go through some of the things that they'll be doing in the festival and kind of help her work out the kinks and enjoy time together. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So she invited, you know, some of her friends that she knows to come and join her and and have time to play together. So I'll be taking lots of pictures. We're, I'm going to be spending a few days after their retreat in Norway, traveling around with Mars because she's also going. And uh, we're hoping to see the Northern Lights. And so if I can catch that on camera for you, I absolutely will because that is on my lifetime bucket li list to be able to see the Northern Lights. Um, what else? Oh, so here is Leaf's vest. He decided he wanted to dye it with Saxon indigo because he wanted it to be a deep blue, like a bright blue. And here it is. I think it turned out great. He had a lot of fun. He's worn it a bunch already. I'm sure it's got cookie crumbs on it. Um, but yeah, it looks wonderful. The color turned out really well. And um, it was super easy. So Saxon indigo is kind of like our first official synthetic dye. The, well, the, the first real synthetic dye didn't come around till 1856, and that was movine. It was discovered by a chemist who was trying to, he was trying to find a cure, um, a synthetic cure for malaria, because we were using quinine that was plant-derived, and he was trying to make a synthetic quinine, basically. Instead, he just discovered synthetic color. But well before that, in 17, it was 1750, 1743, um, there was a man who decided, who wanted to try to get indigo to be more easy to use because there, it's a long process of oxygenating it, creating this vat, and, and it takes a while. So he wanted to try and figure out how to extra, uh, extract that blue from it without having to have such a big process. How he came up with this, I don't know, but he basically combined the indigo with sulfuric acid, and that combination made the Saxon blue. I don't remember why it was called Saxon. I don't think that was his last name. I can't remember. <laughs> Maybe it was because it reminded him of the color from the Saxons. I don't know. But um, it was sulfuric acid and indigo, so it is something that could be done at home. But I wouldn't recommend it because you probably don't want sulfuric acid, which is very powerful in your house unless you have all the chemistry equipment and protective, protective equipment for yourself. But you can buy Saxon Blue from a number of places. I usually get mine from Botanical Colors, and it's pretty easy to work with. They have all the instructions on the website and send it to you also. So that's Leaf's Vest. Toby has decided to leave his marled. He's not going to dye it yet but I have a feeling I'll be able to convince him to do something yellow with it because he loves the color yellow. Maybe when the plants start growing and he sees me getting into the dye pots a little more, he'll want to do that with me. Another thing that I've been doing with dyeing is <clears throat> I went on a really nice hike on New Year's Eve day with my family. We just wanted to get out. It was a beautiful day and um, we went to an area that had a ton of lichen all over the trees, but also all over the ground. It had been raining a few days before that, so it knocked a bunch off. I know you guys have heard me say this before, but I always repeat it. Lichen grows really slow, and so if you take it off of trees when it's living, if you scrape it off of rocks, um, you might be taking hundreds of years of growth. It's so, some of them can be extremely slow growing. So only gather from the stuff that is windfallen on the ground that's no longer attached. That's the stuff that's going to dry up and die and you can use it. If you're in an area where there just isn't a lot, then I wouldn't gather it. So this area had tons of lichen. So it was just 
really littering the floor. So we were grabbing handfuls and putting it in the bag and trying to separate into different types because I found three or four different types. Um, and when I got home, I tested it. There is a, a method of testing, I think it's called the flash method or something like that, where you can use bleach and scrape the, off, the upper layer, the top layer, off of your lichen and then use the Q-tip with the bleach on it to rub it. And if you see a flash of color, bright orange or pink, that is one of the types of lichens that will react with ammonia and create um, a pink, a red, a purple, one of those types of colors. Usually you just use a, a hot water dye bath with lichen and you'll get yellows and greens and browns and um, more neutral colors, I guess you'd say. So four of the ones that I had did not flash, but one of them went bright orange. And um, I looked it up to try and figure out what it was, and I think it's a Sudavaria species. I'm not positive. It looked like little antlers. But, um, but I had a bunch of it, so I decided I was going to put it in ammonia and do the ammonia extraction process. It's a long process, and I'm doing a whole video on it so I can show you guys when it's completely done what it looks like. But basically, you cover it with half ammonia, half water, you want to raise the pH to about nine and a half and you let it sit. Every day you shake it three, four, five times for at least the first couple of weeks. You let it sit for about four months while it's extracting and then you can use it as a dye material. So I have it with me and I was going to show you. If you are averse to bodily fluids, <laughs> here's your warning. <laughs> Because one thing that creates ammonia is your own urine. Um, you know where I'm going with this. There was no point in going out to the store and buying a bottle of ammonia. I had no ammonia at home other than what I could create myself. So after about 24 hours, when your urine goes stale, it starts developing ammonia. You don't pee ammonia. It develops after 24 hours or so. And I tested it, and the pH was a perfect 9.5. So I put the lichen in there, and every day I shake it. And here it is so far. Let's see if I can get it in the sunlight so you can see the color. Right now, it looks kind of um, orangey-brown. It is definitely developing more color than it had when I first put it in. And occasionally, I will see hints of like orange or pink but it's still got a lot of time to go. It is, I think, three weeks old, almost four weeks old. So it's got a few more months. So I will let you know how it goes. So the one last thing I want to talk about before I show you my finished objects is the dye garden along that's happening. There are lots of people who are in the Ravelry group already. We've got a thread going to talk about what plants we're gonna do. Here are my seeds. Um, I have a lot of things in the garden already that I use and some things I buy as seedlings, but what I'm planning on planting next year, this is the indigo, um, that I the indigo seeds I harvested from last year, so I need to go through those and um, winnow them and get the, the extra plant material out, but I've got a bunch of those. I'm also going to plant butterfly pea flower. I want to do some more of that again, and hibiscus, um, lots of coreopsis seeds, because you can just throw those out in a field and get a whole field dyer's coreopsis, which is awesome. Um, and some wild lupine. Hopefully I can get some of those going. All of those I've had before. The one thing that I haven't had yet in my garden is pincushion flower. And that looks like this. So this is pincushion flower, and this dark, it's, it's the Black Knight version, this dark variety makes a really beautiful print and a lovely dye, so I wanted to try this in the garden. All right, so for the finished objects. I think there's only one that you knew about, and it is sitting behind me, and there's no way I'm going to be able to show all of this to you, because it's massive. It is a full queen-size um, queen blanket, and here's my, my progress marker from the last time you saw it, and here is what I've done since then. All of this, and all of this. 
And all of this. <laughs> it's so big and cozy. And one of the reasons I'm podcasting today is because my husband said I needed to hurry up and podcast so we could get this on the bed. Because it was chilly last night and he really wants it on the bed, but I didn't want to put it on there until we were until I was until I'd showed it off. But it has um I started off with every third every fourth row. You can see there's like a purple, another one, another purple. I started off using the 20 colors from the 20 Colors of Matter class that I did with Jackie Otino Graf. And um, I took that with her. She taught it. And I worked through all 20 colors. There's red, there's orange, there's peach. Uh, and just kept going until I ran out of them. I think, I think this was the last one. And then I just kept going with other colors. So I almost made it all the way. This was the last one and this is what I had left to do. But it completely covers the bed and it's really awesome. The cats really like it, which I wish they didn't because I don't want them getting their claws caught in it. But there is also hand knit, I'm sorry, hand spun yarn from a few friends. There's um, eucalyptus dyed yarn from a friend in Australia. There are um, hand dyed yarns from another friend. They're just it's full of memories and I really love it. And on my Ravelry um, projects page, I every time I added a new color, I put what that color was. So some of them just came from leftover scraps from my projects and some of them, like I said, were from friends around the world. So it's super cool. Now I get to put it on the bed. Okay, so the next thing I did, I cast it on on the way up to Vogue. A few years back, Kaya helped me make some eco-printed sock blanks and she was getting all fancy <laughs> and artsy fartsy and she made a couple that were kind of like this. So there's a grape leaf in the middle and then she took matter dye and painted around the grape leaf and then dyed it with indigo. I had two. This was the darker one and then I had a lighter one and here's the remnants of that. So you can see the grape leaf and the matter and then this is a pale blue. They were in the shop for a little while and they didn't sell. And, um, and I think she felt bad that she created things that didn't sell. And I was like, oh, Kaya, they're beautiful. It's just something. It just hasn't sold. Um, and I, a lot of people buy the sock blanks to leave them as they are because they can be, you know, pretty artwork of plants. Whereas this one, I felt like would be super cool knitted up because you would get this blue and red and yellow and brown and all these colors really popping. So I made a hat and here it is. It's just a simple beanie that's a little extra long. I'll put it on. It's not my colors. I'm pretty pale so um, I feel like the pale doesn't, it makes me look even more pale but I really like it. I think it's super cute. Kaya's thinking about whether or not she wants it. Um, I offered it to her first of course but she is, um, she mostly wears black right now, so I don't know if she'll want this or not. It's a little bit bright for her, but let me show you. So you can see how the plant's striped, depending on what part of the plant. So there's the matter, and the brown is the, the grape leaf. Isn't that fun? And then up at the top, there's just a little bit of pooling. So I really like that one. I, I think it's a, fun, a lot of fun to knit with the sock blanks. They're kind of addictive because you want to get to the next stripe of, or the next color. And then the last thing that I have is something that I'm working on with some yarn from Green Mountain Spinnery. And I got this a while ago and I knew when I got this yarn exactly what I wanted to make out of it. And I've finally gotten around to making them. So I am, I finished my first um, the first design and I'm going to be adding more to this packet so that there could be this sized for any okay they're socks <laughs> so it can be sized for any foot it's very hard to say that without coming out with it. I don't want to show you the socks yet because um, I really want to have the whole set finished before I show them to you but here's the yarn this is their ragtime yarn and this is called the holiday colorway and they're all named after ragtime singers and I'll show you the colors that this started with 
Isn't that beautiful? And there's also these. So I'm hoping to have those socks out soon. Um, it's a DK weight yarn, so it's super quick to knit. It took me a day per sock, <laughs> just doing it on the side. So I'm working on those, um, and we may have some different colorways also to show as examples. They're really nice cold weather or chilly weather socks. So if you're looking for a DK weight sock that you're wanting to test knit, let me know. I'm almost ready with the pattern. And there is a little color work, just a little bit in the cuff, so you know before. If you're interested, let me know and I'll send you a picture of it so that you see what it looks like. Anyway, it has been a lot of catching up. I hope you guys stuck with me through the whole thing. Thank you so much if you're still here. I hope you have an awesome month of February. It's my birthday on Monday. I'm going to be 46, so I think it's also going to be 60 degrees. Um, We've had a couple weeks of winter, and that's about it. It's been crazy warm. We've had no snow, but it's supposed to be almost 60 degrees on Monday, so I think I'm going to take out a big old pot that my mother got me. My mother got me for my birthday, um, I, don't, I can't remember if I told you this already, a massive copper fire pit. But I, I wanted it because I wanted to cook um, natural dyes in it. So I'm going to set the fire pit up the copper pot up over a fire and um, use the copper as a way to alter the colors of my dyes. I don't know what color I'm going to use yet, but I have some yarns I want to throw in there and I thought that'd be a lot of fun to do on my birthday. Make a big old bonfire, put the dyes up in the, um, in the copper pot, maybe cook over the fire for my lunch. I don't know. It'll be fun. So I hope you guys have a great couple of weeks. Thank you again so much for your support. You can find me at all the links down below. I'll put everything down there. So if you're looking for Ravelry, the Die Group, um, Patreon, any of that stuff, it'll be down below. And I love you guys and I hope you're doing well. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.